This is video three, and I'm looking at Bond movies 11 to 14, and the non-Eon produced Thunderball remake that brought back Sean Connery, made by Orion Pictures. These movies will span 1979 to 1985, so five movies in seven years. And the first one is Moonraker. It's directed by Lewis Gilbert. And because of the success of Star Wars in 1977, they really jumped on the sci-fi bandwagon. And so 1979, Moonraker got a budget of 34 million. This is over 20 million more than any Bond film previously. It's more than the first four Bond movies combined. So they really went all out with the sci-fi budget and you can see it in the sets hugo drax's temple base thing is pretty cool the space station looks great for a 70s space station but they use money to do an a space battle but they can't copy star wars so they've done them out of ships just floating around and it looks terrible the whole movie is bad it's it's so frustrating to watch there were rumors and an april fool's joke that one of Orson Welles' unfinished projects was a version of Moonraker, which sounds amazing compared to this. It's Bond saves the entire world, which is not really spy, it's superhero, and it's going all over the world. There are so many locations, it's hard to even get grounded, and yet there are boring moments in this film. It's just Bond helping the CIA as if no one can do anything without Bond. And even though they go into space, the plot is still the same as The Spy Who Loved Me. Kill all the people, repopulate. It's it's the same plot as the preceding movie. And it claims to be perfect science, but some of it is nonsense, the lasers and stuff. You have a CIA agent as the Bond girl, and she's fine, but then really boring. She starts off quite interesting, and then just nothing. Lois Childs has nothing to work with. She has one good line, and then she's just empty. Bond is kind of smarmy and boring. No real wit. Like, at least in The Spy Who Loved Me, he was stinging with his horrible misogynist jokes. Now it's just flat and empty and lazy. There's no charm to him. He's surprised that Holly Goodhead is a woman doctor. It's just a poor movie. They start quite well with the stealing a parachute as you're falling, which is pretty cool. But there's just so many elements that are bad. There's the juxtaposition of a pretty tense poisoning scene that's quite well done, immediately followed by a stupid fight where they're smashing priceless artifacts. It's really poorly structured and they bring back Jaws, and there are so many moments that are just cringeworthy in this one. Whereas he'd done surprisingly well in The Spy Who Loved Me. He was just a big, lumbering guy. Now they've added these elements that just make him awful. And they want Richard Keel to do things that he physically can't do. And so it's just put together so badly. They give Jaws his love interest, and it's creepy how they've got this infantilized girl. With this giant guy, why does she need to have pigtails and this little summer dress? It's just awful. But there are moments of tension and Michael Lonsdale is okay with a kind of boring Hugo Drax villain. But there's just nothing really to take. And this one made 210 million, but it's a genuinely bad film. Next was For Your Eyes Only in 1981. Now, after the huge financial success of Moonraker, it's maybe surprising that they decided to go for a much more down-to-earth spy movie here. They got John Glenn to direct, who had been the editor on a bunch of previous Bond films. They give it a budget of $28 million, which is still pretty high. It worked out. They made $195 million with this movie. And it's much better than Moonraker, but there's still plenty of issues with it. It's pretty dull. It starts with killing off of Blofeld, which is just a joke about the court cases they're going through because other studios are trying to make 
a version of Thunderball because they have the rights to that one and the name Spectre. So they're joking and killing off Blofeld at the beginning in this lame scene. They even make a slight reference to his dead wife at the beginning and then completely ruin it with this absurd helicopter drop. Then it goes to this spy ship that sinks and it's a really decent scene. It's a well-made disaster scene. The whole opening act has these elements that work quite well. Bond is making jokes, but he's making jokes to people now. He's getting a reaction from people. She laughs at his jokes. Q says his jokes aren't funny. In the final act, trying to climb up to Christatus's base, it's a tense scene. It's quite good. The fall is a good stunt. It's done well, but it's just not interesting to follow. The entire middle act is so boring. Bond is uninteresting. They thought about swapping more for someone else because he's too old and his contract was up, but Moore basically had the final say and he decided to do another. They tried to make him more down-to-earth and believable compared to the space-fighting Moonraker, and it doesn't work because he's just boring. They go for this old-school Bond is coolest by comparing him to a passion-indulging Columbo villain slash ally and a health nut celibate East German henchman. Like, you're not allowed to be healthy, you're not allowed to be self-indulgent, you just have to have the right martini and the right cigar at the right time, you know? And it just makes him so boring, this middle of the road, and it connects to the theme of Thatcher that they've added, because this is the first movie they've made since Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of Britain, so they bring her into it, it's sexist how they do it, and yet they're trying to say how Thatcher is good. Anyone who knows anything about British history in the last 40 years knows that Thatcher's policies were dreadful, and this movie is glorifying her, even though she's a fucking Tory. And at the end, it's, again, it's sexist, but she's this iron lady, and it's just horrible to watch as someone who's lived through the consequences of her policies. And of course, they go skiing again, which is getting boring. There's a fight with some hockey players that's just terrible. Another infantilized woman. In the previous movies, They'd been amping up the voyeurism. Now it's getting really inappropriate. And for the third film in a row, it ends with MI6 basically watching or listening to Bond have sex. The voyeurism is now celebrated even more to the point that we're voyeuristic to Bond, and it's just horrible to watch. Next in 1983 was Octopussy, where Bond is a clown, literally. It starts with another double O agent as a clown being killed off. And it's emblematic of the rest of the film. It's destroyed anything they did to make it more realistic in the previous film. The pre-titles is absurd. Bond is this one-man army against a circus. It's just not trying to be realistic. They go back to the USSR as the villain. The Afghan villain's quite good. I love his face. But you have this crazy USSR general dictating the violence of the plan. And it's... A clown show, really. Bond is cocky. He's sleazy with Money Penny and her assistant, who is, of course, younger, so he gives her more flowers. It's just creepy. Octopussy is not a particularly interesting character. None of her circus assassins. I don't even know what they are. They're just a confusing use of beautiful women. But ignoring all of the clownishness, the worst thing about this is that it goes to India and acts as if India is a circus he arrives looking like he's walked into the Empire and he's telling people what to do. He finds a snake charmer to be his driver who works for the British government. He goes through a market. If you think about, you only live twice. They go to Japan and he walks through the market and it looks like a proper place. Here, it's a market with all of the most ridiculous things you've ever heard of India in one place like a circus, and it's a total disregard for anything remotely Indian as serious. You either have Indians are circus performers, or you have this opulent wealth that, of course, the British brought to India. And it reaches absurd points. It does the sheep's head meal, which reminded me of Indiana Jones and the inappropriateness of the monkey skull. And they're just not taking anything seriously. They're adding filmmaking jokes that just don't fit when he's swinging from vines and they'd have Vice Muller's Tarzan yelping. 
it doesn't make any sense. They'd done it with music in previous movies, like The Magnificent Seven when he's dressed as a cowboy for no reason, but here it's just even worse. And this is 1983, and there are elements where it's trying to point out that the world is changing and it's really doing it badly. His dismissal of sex discrimination is just uncomfortable. Some of the action's quite good. The fight on the train is decent, been copied a lot since. Unsurprisingly, it's pretty good, but so much of it is disappointing. And again, the middle third, the middle act is so long. It's another one. All these movies are two hours and 10 minutes, and they're all at least 30 minutes too long. They need to just cut out the middle act of these movies. Next, also in 1983, produced by Jack Schwartzman instead of Albert Broccoli, and directed by Irving Kirshner, is Never Say Never Again. The whole feud over the rights to Thunderball had been brewing, and finally they spent $36 million to make a one-off Bond movie, bring back Sean Connery, even though he's 52, remake one of the movies that has been made already, although they do change a whole bunch of it, get Max von Sydow to play Blofeld, who does literally nothing except stroke his cat. It did not need to be made. There are elements where they're trying to be cool. They bring in Kim Basinger as the Bond girl. They get Rowan Atkinson to show up just just to annoy people. But there are key elements missing. There's no gun barrel. There's no tune. They play with Bond being old, which makes sense if it's Connery again. They play with it being different to M. M is now an 80s thing rather than the old-fashioned 60s thing that it still is in the Roger Moore movies. But the whole thing did not need to be made, and they don't know why they're making it. It's so confused. Are they trying to say Bond is an old-fashioned thing? Are they trying to say that that old-fashioned thing is best, that everything new is bad? Because they do that by mocking so many things that are becoming popular in the 1980s, like being healthy and not treating women like crap. He's glorified for doing that. He clings to his caviar and vodka. And it's funny watching now, now that Russian vodka is in no way connected with high standards and quality. There are elements of this that work. They get a very good villain. They've got Klaus Maria Brandauer, after seeing him in a good European movie, to come in with a bad haircut and act his ass off, which... Just reminded me of the latest Casino Royale movie with Mads Mikkelsen. Here he does really well. There are scenes there he does really well. Connery, of course, comes back and does great because it's his fucking role. But he's too old. And so they play with that as if they're mocking Roger Moore. That's the purpose of this movie is to mock Roger Moore, fuck over Albert Broccoli, and remind everyone that people doing their own stunts is good. It starts with this weird Rambo scene that turns out to be fake. Everything about this feels just fake. And there's the awful politics of it, which don't make any sense. Is it trying to be progressive? Is it trying to be conservative? The whole Q scene, just glorifying this Reaganite, Thatcherite, anti-government bullshit. It's awful. The sex scene is terrible. And this is not the first time that a villain is now using sex to get what they want. It's no longer Bond seducing them, it's them seducing Bond which of course he has no problem with, and even though they're using him to get what they want. It's trying to give power to these women, but actually it's just continuing a very misogynistic view of female sexuality. There's another bloody shark of all the things to keep from the older films. You did not need another shark. I know it's in the story of Thunderball, but this is not a pet shark. It's just a wild shark that they've somehow tamed with technology that isn't explained. It's just unnecessary plays on the idea of the old casino with the video games but it doesn't what is it trying to say i don't know it doesn't know it's just making a movie for a little bit of cash and it made cash they spent 36 million and made 160 so it was worth doing from that standard but it adds nothing it mocks without offering anything else after that in 1985 the eon broccoli produced movies you have a view to a kill now a lot of people say that this is the worst one the worst one by a mile it's not by a mile because some of the others are dreadful but it's way 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 down on the list it's just rubbish again it's john glenn back for the third time spent 30 million 
they made 150. So compared to the 200 of Moonraker, it's going down and this is reflective. They get Duran Duran to do a song that, again, it's confusing to me for this tone. Are they trying to glorify the 80s or are they trying to mock it? Because you've got old man Roger Moore in a very aristocratic setting a lot of the time. It starts with their skiing, but he goes snowboarding, but he gets in this terrible looking camouflage submarine for some champagne in that old fashioned Bond way. They go to Royal Ascot, which is an emblem of old fashioned British wealth. Not the first time they've gone for the horse racing, they're trying to play with this Goldfinger element maybe, but it's actually just coming across as aristocratic and conservative British. Then they go to the villain's lair and he's pretending to be an aristocrat, mocking his genuine aristocrat spy chauffeur, which is just a cringeworthy scene that they do three times. Right, they do it once, then they twist it. It's a plant, but then they do it again. It just makes no sense. Thematically in the film, Bond is very, very creepy at the party scene. You've got this old French mansion owned by Christopher Walken's Nazi eugenics steroid using psychopath KGB agent multi-billionaire Silicon Valley guy. It just makes no sense. And they add gory elements and brutal murder in this one. It just doesn't feel like some Bond elements have really translated to 80s movies. I think Rambo had an effect. And because Roger Moore is 57 now, they can't find a realistic stunt double, so there are moments that are just awful. They kill a man with a butterfly. Christopher Walken is rapey in one scene. We've got Grace Jones being great, but totally unrealistic, and the ending is absurd with her. You've got Tanya Roberts being ditzy. They have a brutal shotgun fight. Turns out he's not killing these people, but he didn't know that when he was shooting at them. But they're attacked in her home. And then immediately afterwards, they're fine, flirting, whatever, as if it's perfectly normal for them to be attacked, even though she works in a records office at the council and he's supposed to be a journalist. Just doesn't make any sense. And Bond is dumb and he does that dumb cock of the head. And create a double earthquake. Thing and it's terrible. There's very little positive to take from this movie and it's no wonder that they had to change it after this one. Give him the Order of Lenin and tell Roger Moore to fuck off. One of the things about these movies from the 80s is how confusing the politics is. It's really harking back to this old-fashioned idea of Bond and a British strength, and I think that's coming through in the Thatcherism. The scenes in For Your Eyes Only that glorify Thatcher are horrible to watch, but they do that again with Never Say Never Again with the Q scene. If you look at everything Q says in this movie, it's glorifying this anti-government, pro-free market Thatcherism that's... Yeah, I wish I had a new contract. They've slashed my budget, you see. You can't get the spare parts. And when you can, there's usually some strike that stops delivery. Whereas the CIA made me an offer, I'd be off like a shot. Unlimited resources, air conditioning, 28 flavours of ice cream in the restaurant. Good to see you, Mr Bond. Things have been awfully dull around here. Bureaucrats running the old place, everything done by the book. Can't make a decision unless the computer gives you the go-ahead. Now you're on this. I hope we're going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. I certainly hope so too. Kind of contradictory to a government agent like Bond saving the day. And so it's confusing. And all of these glorifications of wealth that were prevalent in the 1980s like going back to skiing and the introduction of snowboarding and more people doing that, more people going to the Bahamas and Nassau. But they don't like it. They want to show off that all of this is cool, but it's still out of your league. I know the villains live in these mansions, but they're insane mansions that are glorified via Bond being there and enjoying it. There's the references to food and not accessible food that only the super wealthy can afford never say never again it's the bahamas but he has his own gated community it's private you know it's this privatization of wealth to be mine and not yours almost in an old-fashioned way it's old wealth that you will never achieve and it's weird to watch 
a couple of times there's horse racing and owning horses which is old-fashioned idea of class and it is a class thing it's trying to make this distinction between the booming middle class and the actual upper class and it's not just in having money but being old money or fitting in with old money and there are things you have to do for that one of them is blow up silicon valley i guess in a view to a kill or eugenics like moonraker and it's still playing on these old ideas of USSR is bad, offensive to North Africa and Central Asia in Octopussy and Never Say Never Again. Why does Connery go to North Africa and Never Say Never Again? Just to show some racism, I think. So it's glorifying this wealth, which the earlier Connery movies didn't, and it's also criticizing others for being above their station. It just feels like these movies were made for Thatcher. It's it's impossible to relate to Bond in any of these movies unless you are a creepy old man. It ignores actual issues emerging in the 1980s, like it references Middle Eastern oil in Never Say Never Again, but the use of North Africa, it's like this backward place full of villains from Lawrence of Arabia, which they reference in one of the earlier Roger Moore movies. It ignores things like AIDS, Bond can still have sex with anyone he wants, unless he carries condoms with him all the time, he's definitely being irresponsible. And there's a scene in A View to a Kill that kind of pushes home this dismissal, almost, of lower class. And it's in the circus. He comes out dressed as a clown, and everyone is laughing uproariously, like, uncontrollably. And it reminded me of the scene in Sullivan's Travels, which was a glorification of the working class and the entertainment they deserve. Here it feels like the opposite, where it's condemning them to this pittance that this is all they deserve, and they should be grateful for Bond, for saving them, and that Bond deserves all of these things, which is this individual libertarian idea of one person doing it that was very prevalent in the 80s in action movies, but here it's got that class element. It's not Schwarzenegger or Rambo, it's the upper class, and he feels upper class in a way that Connery never did. And even here in Never Say Never Again, it's not saying the upper class is better, it's saying that the new wealth is bad, with their obsession with health, as if that's a terrible thing to care about. How dare he suggest I don't eat red meat, or stop drinking martini every day. So of course it ends with a joke about martini, and a wink at the camera that is just unforgivable. So of these movies, I enjoyed none of them. I'm so happy Roger Moore is finished. I struggled through these five. It was not fun watching. There were moments I enjoyed, but I was grasping for moments to enjoy. So my top three has definitely not changed. It's still Dr. No, From Russia With Love, and Goldfinger. Now the worst one. It had been You Only Live Twice. Now... It's difficult not to say A View to a Kill or Moonraker. Both of them are awful. Really tempted to say Octopussy because of the horrible treatment of Indian culture in this one. But I think I have to settle for A View to a Kill. I think it's the worst one because it's so confused in its tone and the dumbness of Bond. He does the headcock I mentioned, but also the scene on the fire truck. Why does he get out? It doesn't make any sense. He doesn't care that they've been attacked. That doesn't make any sense. He's a creepy old man. The stunts are terrible. The stuntman is, looks nothing like old man Roger Moore. But the one thing that stuck out most that meant that this just didn't feel like anything to do with the James Bond movie is how he writes a note. Bond would remember. 57-year-old Roger Moore has to write giant capital letters to remember the most basic of words. And so the worst movie is A View to a Kill. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. If you want to hear me talk more positively, I think, I'm going to do Dalton and the first three Pierce Brosnan films next week.